Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for uh, thank you for joining us. So we have a uh, a different uh, kind of a different schedule uh, for this afternoon. This is what we call our lightning talks. They're designed to be quick. They're designed to be rapid. They're designed to. Uh, but every seven minutes, we're going to change individuals. We're going to change subjects, and I need to be the first one to yank them off the stage if they get close to their seven minutes. But each each organization, each individual, they have about three to four minutes of prepared materials, topics that they'd like to to, uh, to share with you. And then I'd like to give you the power of the time to ask questions, engage with them, uh, and so on and so forth. So um, we have a specific order that we are we're gonna go in. So Karen, you're gonna go first. Um, then Stacy, then Gina, and then uh, Diego gets to, to be up here um, and speak once again. So I'm gonna set the timer on my phone for seven minutes. So I'll give you I'll see in the back. I'll give you guys a little bit of warning here. But once we hear that alarm, Mid sentence doesn't matter. We gotta stop. We gotta go. Uh, we, we gotta go. We gotta go somewhere. So, Karen, do you want to get up? And you like to, I'll let you give you a chance to introduce yourself. Tell them where you're from, um, and then um, I'll give you the uh, the remote here. And there's your there's your advanced button right there, and you're all set. So, um, there it is. Off. Oh, right, your seven minutes starts now. Yeah. All right. I'm excited to talk to you today about me. PQC's process classification framework, otherwise known as PCF, which is my favorite Um, So, a little bit about me. I'm Karen Appleby. I'm the director of accounting process at CF Industries. Uh, CF is the largest North American producer of IT and fertilizers, so the natural gas is our raw materials and chemical process. Um, and then my role, I'm responsible for building process capability, um, actually, for all of our corporate functions. So pretty much anything from manufacturing or survey for me, and even now I'm like, I could play manufacturing and play that. Um, so um, five or six, starting about five or six years ago, I think kind of, it's important to understand, I think, context for the stories that I'm going to tell you. So starting five or six years ago, we um, started documenting as part of several large projects um, all of our processes. So now most of our corporate processes are actually documented, or we form a good one in one tool. Um, and but one of the things that really frustrates me, and it goes back to the symbol of documentation, but one of the things that frustrates me is that we don't really use all that documentation um, to add value to the business or to do process improvement. Um, most of the documentation is built to support SOX compliance and that's all very fun or doesn't really add a lot of value, right? Um, and so about a year ago, um, I put together a team of managers and supervisors and we started talking about the why is this, you know. Um, and that led to um, a six to seven month actually um, process awareness and skill building campaign that we um, used across our whole corporate um, office. And that included things like process games and fun videos and we built our training materials and we uh, built some new tools like our uh, tree matrix and website. And, we'll put it in the website. Um, and so that's kind of what was going on um, during the time when I'm going to tell you the stories. And, um, and I will tell you in advance these are um, not stories that have big splashy outcomes. Um, my experience has been is that getting people engaged in process is a journey. Um, small steps, anything I can do to get in a moment to get somebody engaged in um, thinking that process is cool and will help them solve their problems, the fair thing, right? So during this period of time, I was anytime anybody comes to me with anything, I would try to use some tool that I had on my website to demonstrate that my tools could help them do that. So that's kind of what was going on, right? Um, so all that said, the first story really what came from um, the main piece of supply chain. He's actually a big, big process um, component, which is not a big surprise. Um, and he had a lot of documentation for processes in um, this area with very low quality. Um, but he was trying to figure out, well, you know, you're making a lot of noise about process. What should my focus be? Um, should I try to document those more strategic processes I haven't documented? You know, what, what should I do? Um, and so I looked out my process classification framework um, because part of this problem was he was just confused about how to organize his thoughts. Um, and so what we ended up doing was looking at two areas in the framework, vision and strategy. Um, they do a lot of strategy work. 
um, and delivering products and services. And so that framework really helped him organize his thinking about the different functions that his staff was performing. And at the end, he decided not to document the more strategic processes and instead decided to focus really on a few areas, specific transportation modes, where product delivery was where they were really struggling. We had some real improvement challenges. Um, so that was kind of the first example. Um, the second was coming from a totally different direction. I was approached by the manager of customer service. Um, and they are anticipating a change in um, their customer portal. And they wanted to do a baseline customer survey um, of their customers uh, to see um, uh, kind of how they were doing and what they should um, change. And if you go, if you Google customer survey, trust me, there are thousands of them there. Um, so we started with that. But our customer service function actually does a lot of different things. And we wanted to make sure that the survey that we put together really would allow customers the opportunity um, to provide feedback on all of those different areas. We wanted space for that. So we pulled out our PC up there. Uh, we actually looked at three areas. We looked at um, marketing um, products, marketing and selling products, which is not a big surprise. Um, we looked at um, delivering services, which is not something we can manufacture what we do. It turned out to be uh, interesting. And we also looked at customer service. And so we kind of explored all those processes, and it really gave us some interesting perspective about what the functions were that they were performing. We ended up adding, adding another couple of questions to what turned out to be only a pretty important question survey. So that was, it was a pretty valuable um, conversation. So a totally kind of different perspective. Um, and then lastly, you know, as an approach, so all the story about process, and um, was having lunch with a uh, guy that's a manager in supply chain, and he's, you know, all the people that are working for me, you know, those people, you know, they're, they're long-time CF employees, and they're just not very externally focused. And how do I get them engaged in thinking beyond CF? How do I get them to do that? And the obvious answer, of course, is benchmarking. Um, so we started talking about benchmarking. He said, oh, they're not going to care about benchmarking. And I said, well, let's, I said, let's think about what you do and see if we can come up with some benchmarks that might really inspire you. And so we pulled our PC up again, and we looked at the um, areas that he was responsible for, we kind of picked those out. Um, and then we went to the APPC website to benchmarks on demand, um, and then just started looking at benchmarks for those particular process areas. And there were a few that were kind of obscure, there weren't many. Um, but for the ones that were less obscure, there were actually a number of interesting ones. And he was able to pick out a few where he just looked at the metrics and he said, boy, that's really interesting, that's really good. And so he walked away from the conversation with several metrics in his hip pocket that he could use in the right moment to kind of inspire his people um, to think differently about the services they were providing. Um, so that's really, that's just my three examples, um, three great ways to kind of demonstrate how you can take a simple tool um, and just take advantage of the moment um, to show how process can happen. Any questions about that? I uh, heard the alarm, Karen, right at seven minutes. Good okay. job. Good job. Thank you. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that um, everybody has an opportunity to fifty ask questions as we, as we wrap up uh, uh, today. And then I know these wonderful people will be available and around uh, for the rest of the day. So if, if you have some specific questions. So Karen, thank you very much. Uh, Stacey, you're up next. You're going to be talking about some of the applications of the uh, process classification framework. What you guys have right? Yes. Awesome. I'll let you introduce yourself. Thank you very much. Um, your time of service. Yeah. Okay, super. So I'm Stacey Bogue-Cottenell, and I work for Cargill. Uh, for those of you who might not know Cargill, they're a Minnesota-based company, global company. We have about 150,000 employees, and um, we are the largest food, ag, and risk management company uh, in the world. I'm based in Minnesota, and I run the North American consulting team, internal consulting, consulting team. Uh, that works with our clients um, in the region. And so I wanted to share some applications of the process classica classification framework um, associated with a project that we just helped one of our clients with. Um, one of the things that I found in working with clients um, over probably 20 years is we need to define what the scope of a project is. So oftentimes I'm working with cross-functional teams 
uh, could be supply chain, commercial, merchandising, trading. Everybody comes into a project with their own perspe perspective and lens and uh, challenges that they've had. And so in the recent technology deployment that we had, we wanted to make sure that everybody understood what processes we were going to be enabling by use of this technology. And there would be other processes that wouldn't necessarily be, be part of the scope of the project. And so we could use this classification framework and set that in front of people to say, here are the areas of our organization and the processes that we would be altering and changing. Um, and almost create like a heat map and a, and a uh, organizational map to know where we would be um, impacting a variety of things. Then we came down to roles and responsibilities. So oftentimes, I don't know who said this. Is that music coming? That was not the alarm. I'm sorry. There's, there's two phones up here. Okay, no problem. So uh, roles and responsibilities. So uh, we all know that processes are end to end and they cross various functional teams. They don't necessarily exist in the silos in which we have our organizations and our hierarchy created today. And so by laying this out on a on a roadmap of sorts, we were able to distinguish who had responsibilities for what and what those points of connection would be between them. It also helps provide the end to end visibility. So again, what does an end to end process look like? I will tell you, and I don't know if it's different in your organizations or not, but we are so hierarchical and functionally siloed. It is really a challenge for our leadership teams to see outside those silos and see what those connection points are. And so again, by using a framework, by putting something in front of them and being able to show them the touch points, oftentimes where I say that, you know, the white space is where activities and jobs really get performed. Um, this provides a, a guidance for that. It also enables us to build some knowledge. So once we identify what is it that we're going to be changing, who has a responsibility for that, what that end-to-end -end looks like, and who's the up and downstream uh, owners and uh, implications of, of that process, we can start to build some knowledge with our key users and stakeholders so that when that is enabled and the technology is in place and they're performing the process, that they know more about it tomorrow than they did yesterday. We also align that with, with KPIs. So as Karen referenced, there's uh, a ton of KPIs and benchmarks that APQC um, affords us opportunities to evaluate. We have some of our own benchmarks internally, and so we take a look at those and marry them up with the framework to see how we're performing, where we have opportunities for improvement. And again, because we have roles and responsibilities and the understanding built, we know who to go to um, and what others to push and pull for that improved performance. And then finally, I feel that this framework is a real uh, business evolution enabler. So we have a history uh, in a company the size of ours, tons of legacy applications and systems. Uh, we are on a multi-decade journey to modernize all of that. Uh, most of our modernization has been associated with ERP, and now we're moving into intelligent automation. And so to have a framework and understand how it impacts people and how their jobs will be impacted and, and what the relationship is between one function and another, um, it's been really useful to help convey that message and get our organization moving in the right direction. Any questions? Okay, so we've got three minutes left in first seven minute period. So we'll have some questions to ask Stacey in terms of how they... Yes, sir. Out of all these operating processes, which ones do you focus on, which ones for the usability? For, for feasibility? Out of these processes, which ones you focused on? Which oh, our focus. Well, okay, so for the uh, technology project that we had, so things like uh, HR was out of scope. Something like supply chain, um, uh, manufacturing, those types of uh, the commercial organization or sales, those were in scope. And so we were able to very quickly identify in terms of this application for this project what we were not going to be touching, what we would be touching, we color-coded this, and then we would work towards enabling that education and alignment um, across all of those things. Along, along those lines, when you're, when you're in a, a vertical, let's say supply chain, and you talked about how your, your or the structure functionally yeah. and breaking those silos is always hard, you talked about it as well. Um, when you got to a place that was, you're looking in and you're doing the 
legal negotiation and contract writing with the vendors in your supply chain that typically would be part of your career as general counsel. How did you ass assign the roles and responsibilities of the owner of that value stream when it had to rely on a high powered general counsel to be subject to that owner? Well, so it, it, I will tell you in our organization, it's work in progress. So when you talk about that end-to-end -end ownership, again, we have clarity of, okay, I'm an obsolete, I'm a supply chain lead. But when we start talking in end-to-end, -end, there is a real wrestling, and I've witnessed this in some leadership teams of, okay, you're going to own a process, but you might not own all of the people and the steps in that process, and you're going to have to work on it. So some of it is just around, okay, working with the leader to say, okay, you're going to own this process. We recognize we have to educate you and inform you, help you understand what an end-to-end -end looks like, or all the stakeholders as part of that end-to-end. -end. Um, but I've seen it where, at least in the level of maturity that my organization is in, a lot of times that comes from the managing director to start placing assignment with people on his or her leadership team to start to own and drive the, the improvements or the execution of that end-to-end. Uh, -end. It's probably not the best way to do it, but... HR has gone through um, some significant transformation over the last couple of years. So the technology project that I was referencing here didn't necessarily include that. That was a, a connection point, but they had already gone through a significant technology transformation. So not part of the scope. Can you talk about the knowledge building some specific examples of what that was? When you say using the framework, why was the framework able to build knowledge? Well, one, just an understanding of what do I own, what do others own, and what are those connection points between those functional silos, okay. as an example. Okay. And so one, it's familiarizing who your stakeholders are, um, providing them opportunities to engage and communicate with one another, and talk about what the metrics are and, and how performance will be evaluated. Well, any other questions that we may have right now? Karen, how are you an apology? I gave you seven minutes to talk, but I gave you seven minutes to read your Q&A. So I apologize for that. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if it's a, taking four. Yeah, I was saying, would you like the opportunity to come back? Does anybody have questions in terms of what oh, Karen? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so even if they don't have any questions, I'd like for you to just stand so here. Fine. Just stand here for two minutes. I'm standing so. here. So um, it's again specific to just Karen's story in terms of how she's leveraging the framework, what she's done from a mapping perspective or from a benchmarking perspective. Did anybody have any specific questions that they wanted to ask right now? Yeah, Karen, that first story you told mm -hmm. about how you used it for sort of scoping, you drilled down through the process framework, and then you identified specific types of transportation that, that your stakeholder wanted to improve as his focus areas. How, how, did, how have you done, um, as far as documenting, a sub-problem that's, that's below level five, that's below that activity level, that talks about the method of transportation, where the framework would just say, you transport from A to B, but the mechanism. Uh, yeah, so in our process documentation, um, we sometimes have, we actually don't, I, we have very low level five documentation. We do have some best practice procedures. Most of our documentation, I would say, is level three. Level three. But, um, but what happens is if we have um, a process that varies by transportation load, we end up just having, like, like, we have a whole section in our product movements section of our um, process documentation. There's one for rail, there's one for truck, there's one for pipeline. And we actually, those processes are very different. When we interact with very so in your framework, then do you, do you customize your framework to so almost be competitive with uh, transport materials, rail, transport materials, truck? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, but they all would still reference the same APPC process. We kind of, I started with APPC when I put the price, when I organized our processes, so that's what I started with. Um, and it's kind of evolved. Um, but we don't necessarily always connect the two exactly together. We do have a process inventory, which is a long list of all processes. And in that inventory, we do not pass the APPC process. Um, but I don't get too thankful about that. It's not truly hierarchical, is what I'm hearing. Um, no. It's more no. relational. It's relational. <coughs> um, and you know, I mean, so CF is, is not, it's a one gas for you guys, if you call um, And so there are a lot of processes that don't apply to us, really. Um, and, you know, what what is in the end for somebody else might not be able to do it. Right? So, I mean, there's some personalization involved, right? You just have to look into it. <coughs> what tool do you use? Um, we use Blueworks. I mean, Blueworks. <coughs> Thanks, Karen. I'm sorry. And again, we'll, we'll see if you have some time at the end if there's other questions that uh, this will certainly come up. But Gina, are you ready? I am. Uh, yeah. uh, hopefully, the technology will cooperate and we'll get the blue screen up. Uh, blue screen up there. But uh, Gina, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you're leveraging APC resources as a whole yeah. outside, okay. of just, uh, outside of just outside of just So uh, your seven minutes. Okay. Tell me a little hit. Okay. No. <laughs> I'll stand in the back and I'll give you the. Just get the hook and yeah. Pull it out. Okay, that'll work. Okay, so I work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Um, again, Gina Alexander. I'm a senior, uh, senior ERP business analyst. Um, for those of you who think that the Federal Reserve prints money, we do not. So you will not have takeaways to gay of money. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Oh, yeah, no free giveaways today. I just you know that now. We have have a little bit of money at the bank, but we just don't give it away. So, um, another thing, just since I brought up money, uh, we have sustainability programs so that when the money that comes into the bank is in disarray and, you know, whatever, it gets shredded, and that's actually used in compost. So, sustainability there now. <laughs> so, money does grow on trees. Uh, absolutely, very good. Excellent. No, 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 trees grow on money. <laughs> well, <laughs> it is mixed in with all the other stuff that we're trying to talk about. <laughs> so, um, another thing um, I was going to say, uh, if you have any questions later on about the interest rate, I know nothing about the current interest rate, um, so don't ask me. Um, I don't have the Chairman Powell's number, so you can't ask him. And so you're just stuck with what I'm going to tell you about APC. Okay? Gina, people might start leaving soon. Like, I don't buy the lead with all of these information. Hey, people it's good information. <laughs> We're good. So I'm here to talk about maximizing APC's membership resources. And what I'm putting that against is my career so you understand where I've been and how I've used APC along the way. Okay? So with that in mind, uh, I'll bring that magic slide. Okay, so a long, long, long time ago, when I first started and got my first real job, I happened to be at a Yellow Page advertising company. You can tell probably where that is these days. <laughs> anyway, I started there, and surprisingly enough, they were doing benchmarking with other competitor Yellow Page advertising. And uh, that's the first time I'd ever heard of benchmarking. That's the first time I had a real big job, right? So I learned about benchmarking. And over time, I learned about APC because we're working somewhat with APC. So we're a member, find out they have key resources and things like that. But this was so long ago, we won't say that, you know, information is hard to get at, the, at that point, perhaps. But I learned more about it. And by the time that I'm getting ready to leave, I've actually taken over benchmarking for the entire accounting area. So that we did, you know, the benchmarking, we did every year. I took care of that. It was great. We moved on, right? So I went to a sister company, and I took that benchmarking information with me and said, hey, I know all about benchmarking now. And I went over, and I actually worked in, um, it was customer satisfactory, uh, customer satisfaction and quality, blah, 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 whatever my name was for the day. But basically, I um, actually analyzed the root cause analysis on customer complaints and commendation because we wanted to make sure if people were making compliments, we want to hear about that too. So it was like, well, what can we do here? And we started looking at more information of what we could use from APC. And it was about that time 
um, and it was many years ago, and said that NPC actually had a consortium they were doing on customer satisfaction. And I talked my management into, we need to be sponsored in this consortium. We want to sign up because we want to hear about that study that comes out of it. So indeed, we did that. And, um, you know, again, uh, things were getting better with the internet and things like that too. So you got to realize that that was kind of picking up at the time. So more and more information for APC was actually making out to the internet. So we do a lot more um, setting out there in things like the case study. So resource library is what it's called now. So you what and I think it used to be called knowledge base. So each one of these things, so we, we learned more and more about what we could. Um, so move forward, I went to third company. So I don't move around a lot. So there's many years in this and the third company, guess what? They were also members of APQC. So every time that anybody asked about benchmarking, metrics, case studies, you name it, best practices, I went to APQC website and I looked at everything. Now, by the time that I transferred into my, uh, let me see, fourth company, I actually went to an organization, uh, University of North Texas, okay, which is up in Denton, Texas. And when I went there, I had all of this in my pocket. And at that time is when I finally found the PCF. And I went and I was looking for a numbering system to use for standard operating procedures. But what I found is the PCF. And when I started looking at it, I was like, we could use that. So what I did is we set up a plan. Basically, I took a business plan with all of the thing, all of this information that I pulled together, case uh, studies and white papers and everything, PCF, and went in there and sold my management debt. We need to set up a document repository. We need to standardize our documents. We need to put metrics in our, with our, you know, the information on, based on the PCF, we put it all into a SharePoint site. So that was in the works that we were working at. So uh, interestingly enough, um, ABQC asked to, you know, talk to me in my group because I actually, I mean, I literally was promoted and that's not to go, oh, look at me. I'm just saying if I didn't have that information, if I didn't sell it, it would have happened. And I had three brand new people that they gave me. And we talked to APQC, told them what we did, and they wrote a case study. Okay. So about a year and a half ago, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, the person who happened to be over um, the AP uh, side of the business, so shared service environment, um, ran into that case study and asked one of us people who used to work at UT, do you know somebody there? And she's like, Yes, I do. The person who actually they interviewed for it. <laughs> and then you can see now I'm at the Federal, Bank, uh, Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. But all of this is to say that you have all of these resources and it's boundless. It's like every time I go out there, I find more and more and more. The case studies are great. The best practices are great. I watch webinars. If you can't attend the webinar, you can just pick it up on demand later on. Now, I'm not being paid from APQC to say this. I'm saying this is so much of where my knowledge is. If my, um, you know, our officer's bank says we need information, I go here because it tells me information and I can do best practices. So with that in mind, I just want you to know how much is there, what you can use it for. Um, I can talk to you extensively later on about the PCF. There's a whole lot I can tell you about how we use it. And, Go ahead, yeah. please. Anyway, anyway, absolutely. Take, take set, let's, let's do Q&A, and then finish your talk, let's do some Q&A. Yeah, so anyway, I just wanted you to know, so it's there, and, and I've got information on it, but I want you to use the resources, because every time that I go in, and I've got new people that are around, or people are, I, I say, are, all you have to do is register for an APC. We're a member already. We pay for it. Just sign up. Okay. So that's my two cents, my sales job. Awesome. It's free of charge. Thank you. Sure, we, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. So, so, you, you so have you ever been like the, the, per, the point of contact for the APQC membership? I mean, so all the business dealings between APQC and whoever you're with, uh, were you ever in that role? I was, when I was at the University of Texas, my boss is the one who paid the bill on it, basically. You were the main point of contact. I talked to them several times when they were looking okay. for somebody okay. to pay. So, <laughs> so, the question, so the question I have is, you know, there's all this material out here, mm -hmm. and how much transformation of material from what APQC has on their website did you have to do for people to use it? Or did you just hand them, here's the APQC to study, or here's the APQC. Okay, that, that's a good question. Okay, that's a really good question. So, 
I'll tell you right now that with, in my current job, a lot of times I will, um, because I get several, like we get emails and stuff in that, you know, from HPC because I've signed up for different things and I'll get something, I'll read the articles and depending what it is, sometimes I summarize the pieces and then I attach that case study or white paper, whatever it is, and then I send it out to management folks in my area. Remember, there's probably, I don't know, eight or nine of managers. I will send it. If I find it something that I think staff will like, I send it to them. Um, a lot of times when I'm selling kind of stuff, like when I sold the thing to, hey, you know, at UNT, we, you know, we really want to do this, I took all the case studies and all the stuff, and I combined it to a business plan. Okay, so I get it. So I've been process improvement forever. I mean, I started out in a place that, you know, got the mouth on Baldrige almost from the get-go. I mean, I, that's just where I've been. I'm lucky for that, but I just keep on processing through. But I, I, I want to make it in like little bite-sized pieces so I know they'll read it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. 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 And Bill, before the ego gets up here, but he's going to be talking about that in terms of kind of the internal communication, how it promotes it, and the usage, and that type of thing. So I think that will extend mm -hmm. extend mm -hmm. our conversation. So, what else? Who else? Who else has questions? Well, I would say that if when you get a chance, go out onto you know out into the resource library, look at you know the various stuff on PCF. Um, I think it's great, and I, I have this. Have you visited the APQC website lately? If not, you need to do that. And, I and we say, just changed it. We just updated you it. You did. Different. It, yes, and it confused me a little bit. It does. <laughs> but I did figure it out, and if I can figure it out, everybody can figure it out. <laughs> so, one of my problems, I would say, or, is that there's so much information, mm -hmm. distilling it down. I don't have hours to go look through all the information. I can uh -oh. get. Like 235 responses to the topic. Yeah. yeah. Do ask so the APQC. Tips. Yeah, ask the APQC. Tell them what you're searching for. And yeah. they will respond. Ask APQC. So, there's so a, APQC. That's okay. All right. Yeah. So, Tammy, do you mind for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. So, Tammy, on the, on the website, there is a area, and I don't know exactly where it is on the new one right now, but it's called Ask Us. Okay. And essentially, you click on that Ask Us button, and you fill out an online form that says, This is who I am, this is my email address. I'd like some research on, and you could say end to end processes or give it some kind of focus there in terms of what you're specifically looking for. And instead of getting, instead of getting the 235, you make it five to 10. And we'll say, hey, these are the top case studies, or this is the most recent research, or this is the research you asked for, but here might be some metrics that also correspond and correlate to that. And our research services team, the one that actually manages all of the um, information that is now on our, our resource library. They're the ones that have intimate knowledge of what has been published lately, what could we use, how could we leverage this. So that might be an opportunity to slim down okay. some of the uh, some of the information. That you're doing. So it's so called ask. Drink from the fire hose. Yeah. Right. 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 And right. I tend to drink from the fire hose because that doesn't bother me. When it comes up, I start opening. I must drive them crazy. I mean, if they're looking for metrics, it's like, oh, Gina's at it again. Because you, I will sit there and one by I will slip through. I don't have a pen. I, I know. We well, yeah. do, do have a switch we have to flip on the servers over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, the question they say, you recently downloaded the software from the APQC. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think about it? I think on a day when I'm downloading like 50. Yeah. Which one you're talking about? Okay. All right. So that's going to be that's going to be back for us then too. So. Okay. Yeah. But it's so. Kind of fun. Yeah. I'm binging. That's yeah. the best way to put it. Maybe you can see a chill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. We good? Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. So then, Dana, you want to, would you like that? Uh, would you mind coming up and uh, we don't need you to practice your AKS speech again. Right. So you're, you're finished with that. You're finished with that. Um, but if you wouldn't mind just talking about it again. How you're promoting it? What type of usage you're saying? Um, are you? Do you have people coming up to you and asking you? Do you have uh, any so the stories that you have from your life perspective? Sure. So thank you. Your time starts now, sir. All right. Uh, hey everyone, I'm Diego. Um, I'm from CMI, and um, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the footprint that we have at this moment from APQC in CMI. Um, and the reason why I share this is because um, this is comparing 2017 against 2019. We've been members for like three years. So this is full year against full year, so apples and apples. Um, 
We've doubled the number of users from where we started, um, and we've also tripled the number of documents that we download. So to your points, how you download and consume that content, we, we ask for a report at the end of the year, and then we track that and realize where like, the top people are downloading content and getting in there. And we also kind of, um, even though there's me or someone else from my team for like the contact, like the key accounts internally for APQC or the go-to person for APQC, we do promote that people get in there themselves and explore themselves and kind of more like you you research I'll teach you how to do it but then it's pretty simple for you so you do it um, but this is the, the one number that I want to highlight from this slide is um, of course there's a return on the investment and of course um, we're also subscribed to other you know big information sites um, but we, we had that question asked a couple of times in the past can we cut this from our budget and not renew that membership and I mean we've already it's already served the purpose and the answer is no, we still want to renew it because as we've seen, um, the annual cost in our case is, is that. If you compare that against the, the, the cost avoidance that we've generated from all the documents we're consuming, all the information we're getting, the templates, the tools, best practice and all, uh, it, it offsets it 26 times. So it's like, come on, no discussion there. It's, we're paying you know, one small portion of the all the content that we're generating there. So over the next couple of minutes, I'll give you four big groups of things that we're doing that help us to do this. And hopefully when we get the 2019 picture, they'll continue to grow. So it'll be interesting to see that as well. Um, okay, so first we're creating awareness internally. Right, so well, some of the things that we did was uh, APQC comes up every now and then with infographics, which are really easy to consume, buy some pieces, people don't like to read the big documents sometimes. So we took some of them, we actually took some of them, literally translated them and gave them the CMI look and feel so that we shared it and then we always reference it to here's APQC and you can download the content and check it out. And we've also created some pieces of our own. So sometimes we blend in success stories from CMI with actual facts from the surveys that they run and some of the good numbers that they have. So kind of blending both worlds together through the graphics. Then we also came up with a one pager. So people would ask us, could you come in and tell our department how we can leverage APQC? So we came up with this one pager, everything's in it, uh, check it out. Now that they've updated the site, they messed with all this, but uh, I'm gonna have to update all these documents, but hey, that's just part of it. Uh, but basically, just providing people with one page where they can just check and find out everything that APQC has to offer. Then we also came up with a user guide, you know, the click by click, where do I go to? Because to your point, you could be our well once you're navigating through the content and people's like, I don't have time to do that. So came up with a pre-UC um, user guide. We also did a webinar in Germany uh, where we said, okay, what's APQC, what it has to offer? From our process perspective, we talked about the seven tenants and we gave you like the fundamentals workshop that these guys have. We gave like the CMI version of that in one hour. And then also to pick the interest for people that might be interested in knowing more about it. Um, and then we also came up with an e-learning. So that's like a 45 minute e-learning that walks you through starting building process capabilities and also reference you to the PCF and APQC and all the good content that's out there. This is Number one, creating awareness. Number two, we have adopted the PCF, indeed. Uh, we translated it into Spanish um, for user adoption. Um, then we also, every time that we have a process mapping workshop, uh, we, we ask process experts to map their process on their own language, on their own terms, using their own uh, definitions. But after we like dot it on the wall, then the next step is, okay, so how can we match it and blend it with the actual PCS? So tell me the code, tell me the number, tell me the process area or the process to process task activity, depending on which level we're, we're mapping, uh, how that correlates to the PCF. Um, and then once we come up with the actual document that I was saying earlier that we deliver as a result of that workshop, everything's tied into the PCF. And finally, there's Mosaic, which we just started exploring this year. Um, like I said, we have three years with APQC, but it was not until this year that we started using this. And something really neat about Mosite is that it comes as part of the membership. So it's like a cloud-based solution where you can link in your process that you documented with the actual PCF. So it, it's easier to navigate around the content because if I'm like the process owner for this particular process and I'm looking for benchmarks for this step, I can just like drill down and it'll give me best practices, APIs, benchmarks for that one step only. Um, so it's really cool because you can you can also incorporate your own activities that might not be in the PCF and give them like a number on your own. Um, so it's it's a cloud-based solution. We started playing around with it this year. Um, it's got some limited functionality, but it helps us for our center of excellence purpose to link content with APQC. 
Uh, number three, shares the sharing from the knowledge base. So yeah, we same as you guys. We subscribe to the content and we kind of read over it. And here's two examples: digital transformation one and planning and budgeting or forecasting is another. So I get a uh, sneak peek of what's the content in it, and I forward it to a couple of senior directors, some of the people who take the decisions on the budget, but also some of the people who are actually working on these things and struggling with this. And say, hey, here's a couple of best practices. Check them out. Let me know what you think, or maybe there's content that's interesting. And sometimes they do. They they, they say, can we have a call with them? And the membership also includes a couple of hours that you can ask to like call with the experts. So we'll tell them, we'll get together like 10 different managers and say, okay, we want to talk about this share center set. And we get them all together and we get a PPC on the phone and everybody starts to shooting questions at them, right? Um, then we also create our own CMI case studies. So we've had two. We have one that talks about the end-to-end -end processes, a little uh, elaboration on what I presented earlier. Um, and the other one talks about our digital transformation uh, process. So those are two CMI cases that we've created. And the reason why I include this is because it also serves to generate awareness internally. Because now that we have them, it's kind of like the saying, well, here's a thing because you recognize that something that we're doing is a good practice. So, you know, let's you know, be proud about it. Also, let's create that awareness internally that, you know, just as much as our case, there's other good companies out there that are doing great stuff. Let's look into what they're doing. Let's have calls with them. Let's connect with them. You've seen me probably talking in Spanish outside. That's because there's a lot of Latin American companies that connect to us because they're like, a lot of times the benchmarks are from the US, but they're not from Latin America. How much have you leveraged from this? And we've started to connect with different companies from Latin America as a result of these cases. And finally, uh, promoting benchmarks. So there's three different types of assessment that APQC offers. So we've done benchmarks on the net, which is really quick go to ask for a specific part of PCF benchmark. The assessments, which is a more robust, full detail, and we fill those out for internal controls. And maturity models. We've done the knowledge management and the process performance management, both um, maturity models. Really great to leverage yourself and know where you are and the gaps to get to the next level. Great. Thanks for, for going to. So, what about questions for Diego? Can you go back one slide? Yes, sir. So, uh, did you do self assessment? or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, um, we we did uh, well. The way that they do, they do this is there's two. There's a very quick and like a ten question yeah. for for yeah. processes, right? But there's also a more robust uh, oh, yeah. Excel sheet that they share with you. And oh. if you don't fill out like the first level, if you don't complete all the requirements, then you can't mark yourself on the next level. And they ask you to provide evidence to support each. So we send that, and then they come back and tell you, okay, based on what you provided, there's our suggestions or our recommendations. And we're talking about the KM. That's, the KM is the one we submit. The KM is the one we submit. And the PDM yeah. is not submitted. Correct. Just, uh, and ten correct. questions. Yeah, correct. Yeah, correct. The the KM it's we internally it's called the KM category. Yeah. Knowledge management capability assessment tool yeah. is what we call it. And so yes, that one is more robust yes. right now than the business process management one. We're in the process of getting the B, uh, PPM or BPM, however you like to look at it, uh, assessment tool on the same level as the knowledge management tool. But that'll probably be first quarter next year. Uh, sorry, and then on your benchmarking. Yeah. Uh, what is a benchmarking assessment? So basically, we have to fill out a huge list of questions that these guys offer, and they say, okay, so give me your full time equivalents. Depending on the area that you're asking the assessment for, they'll they give you a big questionnaire. Oh, oh this, is, out, this is where you fill out your data and then you get yes. the benchmark back. Yes. So how do you compare? Okay. Exactly. Yeah, so here's, here's consuming a specific KPI or a specific benchmark. Here is, could you please assess my procurement pay function? And then they come back with a full assessment. Yeah, so this one is self consumption. Yeah, this one's kind of trading, for lack of a better analogy. And that was the maturity assessment you told us. Yes, yes. Sir, sir. So, do you map your processes absolutely to the um, PCF? Yes, yeah. yes. So, we did, I mean, we tweaked the electronic PCF okay. to me. Some of, some of our processes didn't fit mm -hmm. certain areas, so we got our numbers are a little bit off. Sure. So it sounds like I wouldn't be able to leverage the mosaic. You can, you can because you can create uh, your own numbers and your own boxes. So like you can create from scratch, and that one won't be linked to any best practice or KPIs or anything. But it, it, it's going to respect the order that you have for that particular activity. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, go ahead, Tim. You know. How do you do it? Like we are automotive and we are IETI certified, um, and the automotive PCF doesn't quite work for us because we're not an OEM. 
but there's components of the automotive one that we absolutely should be doing. So how do you do blended PCFs like that, like the classic, classic one and the automotive one? We use it across industry for lack of, because we have so many different industries being represented, so it's not going to be a perfect fit, but we use it across industry for most cases. Uh, I don't know how to better answer for that. Yeah, yeah, do you mind if I, if I kind of give you some supplemental information on it? Yeah. So we actually, for a lot of organizations that we work with, they do have, they touch different industries or different areas, or, you know, the cross industry might be a good start, but you're right, automotive, we have, there's some pieces in terms of how, uh, yeah, it's completely different. So, so what we do for a lot of clients is that um, we'll actually compare or mesh some of them together. We essentially create a custom process classification framework for them. So um, my guidance would be to you is to say, take the pieces and parts of the ones that make the most sense and, and leverage those into creating a process classification framework for your organization. The couple of the caveats that I will provide to you there though is you have to make sure if you pull pieces from the automotive into the cross industry as an example, we have to make sure that you do a audit that says, are we duplicating anything? Because remember, the, the process classification framework is mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, so there's no duplication. So when you pull something else in, you have to do an audit that says, did we accidentally duplicate anything? And if we did, where do we want it to, where's the one place we want it to reside in our new, in our new framework? And we do, we do a lot of the customization that happens for that. To, as, a, as a kind of a continuation of your comment there, do you want to go back to your mosaic scratch real quick? So as a, as a continuation of that, if you start to use mosaic, then it also gives you the ability to start to pull that information in, pull information from different frameworks to create them. So you may have some custom elements that you created, like you mentioned, that you said, hey, these are specific to us as an organization. It's not in the framework, but we want to make sure we capture it. We know it's not going to have best practices or measurements, but it's in our end-to-end -end process. Um, you, can, you can do that as well. So um, it, it just sort of one more. typically organizations start with the Excel version of it. They do the manipulation of it. They get the conversation in it. They see who's working with it, who's not working with it. And then as they get a little bit more mature and familiar with the framework and how it works and what they've done and their end processes, then they start to measure something. And John Tesmer is the leader of our uh, open set of standards benchmark that is the product manager for those things. So, does Mosaic help you help find the duplications? If you're in doing it in Mosaic, Mosaic does not find the duplications. Okay. Okay. It, is, it is the process owner, business process manager, or whatever term in your organization is that team's responsibility to identify duplications. You had a question a moment ago, and I, I was, you were asking about a slider. Yeah, no, I was asking about that. You interject or wait until the end. Okay, well, <laughs> well yeah, so interject now. Now oh, is the time for interjection. Yes, please. So I had a question on the numbers. When uh, the benefits that you derive, does 1.3 million, is it all over a three year period or at the end? And how did you measure that? How did you quantify the benefits into dollars? Uh, I asked these guys to give me the report. So <laughs> they, they send us a consumption report, if you would. So it tells me user by user and, and document by document what's the cost of that document if I were not a member. So like we total those numbers up and that's where the 1.3 million comes from. So it's kind of like a cost avoidance. Like if we were not APPC members and we would have still accessed that content, it would have cost us this oh, much money to get access to that. So it's not a business value benefit per se. When right. you say this is tied, this is tied to the process that we've adopted and then this is the business value that we would realize best off that. So this is based on the annual membership and how much we're consuming the information from APPC. That is not Right, all right, so like they have specific costs every time that they do like assessment. So if any, you do 10 of those, then of course that's, you know, the number increases. Right. So you're introducing one, then, you know, it's lower. So it's kind of like a, a mix between the cost of documents, the cost of assessment, the cost of benchmarks, all that put together. And that just that usage report is something you can get from your member success manager if you're ever interested. So, so Jonathan, so do you guys have case studies where clients have actually told you this is this is us before and after APQC, and this is how much business value we've actually derived from or just engaging you as a I don't know if we have any that are specific to use it's a great question. I don't know if we have any that are specific business value that we could say it, you know, it, because it's it's so it would be so difficult to I was do. gonna say it's, it's gonna be difficult to isolate the effect of APQC on that because like I can tell you we've generated half a million dollars in three years with our process initiatives. How much of that is equitable to APQC? Half a million. It'll be <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's hard to it's to just real part. I don't know, it's hard to um, 
equate like what what portion of this was yeah. APQC related, APQC supported, directly tied. And again, it's not APQC. It could be any professional services yeah. from any vendor that you partner with. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's hard to come up. Well, so, so uh, well, the reason why I'm asking is sometimes companies say, you know, we need to adopt this framework because we need to streamline our processes. So, and then if they adopt your framework, then you can actually tie the business value to APQC. That was awesome. That's what I'm asking. <coughs> but then you've got some case studies that tell you this is how much money we've actually saved. Maybe it's cost saving. Oh, we created a new product, but we didn't know how to launch the product. So we adopted your framework, and this is the value that we derive from it. So there, there is, I don't know if it's specific dollar amount. There's one case study that is on our knowledge. Sorry, resource library. I'm kidding. Um, it's by Elevations Credit. Yes. Um, it is really good. It's, it's, it's a woman by the name of Carla Wolf um, that is a friend of APPC that really talks about how she not only leveraged the framework, but what it allowed her to do from a time perspective and from a, and again, I can't say hard dollars, I'd say soft dollars probably more than anything, but that might be one that you, you want to look at. Yeah, okay. so, okay, go, go. I'm glad to share that with uh, people that actually pay the money, because for me to justify that we want to invest in this, that's the question that I'll ask. Yeah, so, so it's called, it's, that's elevation credit. Is that free for? Yeah, oh. it should, it, and if it isn't, let me know. Yeah, so, go ahead. I was going to point out that is the thing. When we built out the thing for University of North Texas, one of the things is Elevation Credit Union. I'm glad you brought it up because when people were having problems understanding what PCF is, mm -hmm. sometimes PCF, I would give them that. Yep. And if you give them that and they read it, they really read it, then most people it clicks with. It's suddenly mm -hmm. like, oh, I get it. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So it's, it's, it's one of our, I mean, it's, it's such a great story. It's, we actually, Carla's the woman's name. We ran into her at a completely different conference and just by chance, but she has a really good story. And, and also, I just want to say, like, in terms of credibility internally, you know how we use in IT the measure quadrants from Barger, and that's like, everybody's like, oh, so is it in one of the quadrants? Yeah, we've had that. We've started to get to that point with some of the APQC content. So, we're like, people internally say, where do you get that? I from APQC. Oh, okay. So, like, they'll respect that source. And they'll be like, oh, no, we can trust that. So it's started to gain that momentum where now people outside, every time there's a process or a question, it's like, did you check with MPQC? And it's like, yeah, okay, so it's good. So that's earning that internal credibility that's also helpful with it. You had a question? Well, sorry. actually, it's more common for payback. I mean, the simplest way to justify APQC is the first time someone asks you a benchmarking question, go, how long would it take us to go do this? That's probably more than membership fees. You're done right there. And, and everything else is just great. The benchmark is yeah. so bad. Yeah, that's a benchmark. You, you're going to spend upwards of $100,000 to get a benchmark. You get a benchmark. So why not just pay $2,500? And you're done. Okay. Right? So, I mean, that's, that is easy. Because then you're not out there trying to guess how much of this was the APQC, how much of this was the business case. Like the, the credit union conversation, that's mm -hmm. a singularity. That doesn't happen very often. Right. That kind of story is a rarity, right? So you can't justify ongoing expense on sure. singularity. So you have to have. Something else kind of walk yeah. yeah. We're we're proud of our we're proud of the data that we're able to provide yeah. our organizations back to back to you. Yeah. That's the most important part. That's you know, hey, I got it back in two weeks and it cost me twenty three thousand dollars. Right. Good luck. I'm out. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, Karen, go ahead. Um, so the um, monthly benchmark. Monthly metric. Um, and those are great for awareness. I usually really take that and say, we do have a good news for the month. <laughs> <laughs> and it's fabulous because I usually get that. Where'd you get this? You know, uh, this can't be right. You know, I go, hey, look. Yeah, so it's a great conversation starter. Uh, um, so that's a great way to place it. That sounds like. Yeah, it's totally like that. Just one page, really fast. Any other questions for Diego, Karen, Stacey, or Gina? Well, hey, I hope this was helpful. We appreciate you listening to their stories in terms of how they're leveraging. Again, it wasn't designed for us to be a commercial for the organization, but really an opportunity to say, okay, we're members, but maybe we don't use that component, or how would we leverage this part of the um, this part of the membership? Or we use it this way, but maybe we could also add to it. So if you guys have any questions about you know how they're leveraging, they're nice enough people. We might have paid Gina. Gina might want some money back. But um, they're, 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 uh, 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 they're
they're they're absolutely nice enough. So maybe you can buy them a free drink tonight at the cocktail list. Yeah. 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 And uh, and they may they may share some more stories. But thank you guys very much for spending your time sharing with us. Thank you guys for being here today. Have a great afternoon. Um, I'll see you back in the uh, the main uh, ballroom there in uh, about forty minutes.